All right, we're recording. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is David Ellis again here. Uh, I am the artistic director of Earth and Air String Orchestra, as well as the solo cellist in our most recent project, Thankfulness in Solitude. And I am here with another composer that we are featuring on our program. This is Ryan Raymer. Ryan, wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much. We're going to get a little bit into the pieces that you wrote with their very elaborate Latin titles. But before we do, I uh, thought let's start with a few questions just kind of to give your background. So um, firstly, kind of what, what instrument did you start with and how did you get into music generally? And it may have been through composition, but then also what got you specifically into composition? Uh, well, my primary instrument is piano and I've been studying since third grade. So a long time. Yeah. And uh, I originally wanted to take a uh, violin, but we already had a piano in the house in the basement. So my parents were like, you know, you're going to use what we have. And I am totally glad I did. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, a much uh, better base for being a composer because um, playing through compositions, you know, you can do mul multiple voices and things. Mm -hmm. And I also find the best piano music is written by pianists as I'm sure the best cello music is written by cellists, or at least people who play cello. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've been playing um, and writing uh, since my, I started writing after my very first lesson. I remember having three notes to learn and it was some dinky little melody in uh, my workbook. And so I was like, I can do that. So I wrote a melody also. And ever since then I've been writing, um, you know, daily, nearly daily. Well, you've been writing for a whole variety of instruments and it's not just piano, even though, you know, we mentioned that, uh, mm -hmm. but you've really written for pretty much all the orchestral family. And I'm wondering kind of, is there any instrument that you would say uh, you're drawn to more? It can be the cello, it doesn't have to be though, but just to give us an idea of kind of the sound world that you're coming from. Well, you know, I am drawn to harp because I feel like everything you write for a harp is beautiful. <laughs> so that's kind of one of those instruments that's tough to go wrong with. Mm -hmm. uh, I also uh, really happen to like cello because I like the deep, rich tones that are sort of in the range of my own speaking voice. So I have uh, you know, a big connection to the lower instruments like bassoon and cello or uh, uh, you know, even viola in its lower uh, registers, I find mm -hmm. to be uh, a big connection to my own voice. Mm -hmm. well, that's wonderful stuff. Um, what composers would you say influence your style the most then? Well, you know, it's funny because my favorite composer is Poulenc. Yeah. But I was writing in the style of Poulenc before I even ever heard Poulenc. Yeah. I yeah. was taking a piano lessons in college. It wasn't even until college, like my fourth year in college that I discovered Poulenc. And I was taking at Baldwin Wallace from a French piano instructor, mm -hmm. uh, Laurent Bocopsa, who's like a, was a world touring pianist and he settled at VW. But because, you know, Poulenc is French, uh, he just had assumed that I had heard of Poulenc and then he brought it up in some lesson. And I'm like, no, I, I don't know the name. I don't know any works by him. So it was really mind blowing to hear works by a composer that was speaking my language. Um, I, I guess I was naturally attracted to the French sound. I have French in my lineage. Uh, my mom's maiden name is Diffie. Mm. So I guess it's just in my genes. Yeah. Uh, so that's been uh, a big source of inspiration for me. Uh, it helped me sort of not only find my voice, but tell me where it can go. Because Poulenc um, has a style, but it's a broad style, I feel like. There's a lot of different elements to Poulenc. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, encouraged me to find a voice and then stretch it, you know, as much as I can. Absolutely. But outside of him, I love Bach, you know, and uh, Beethoven and Mozart, uh, because everyone should. <laughs> but I, I really do enjoy them, for real. And uh, I've always been a big fan of Rachmaninoff, too. I like his uh, piano writing. He uses a lot of chunky chords. And it was the first time that I was ever playing chords with, like, ten notes, like, all my fingers were engaged, you know. And then I thought chords couldn't get any bigger and I discovered Henry Cowell, who mm. uses arm clusters. Mm. And so the notes, uh, 
you know, were played by different parts of my body. I was playing notes with my arms and my elbows and my fists. And uh, so that was really eye-opening to know that I could make chords as big as, as the keyboard if I wanted. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, um, right now there's a, a fabulous and Composers Guild member, uh, Nick Underhill, who's mm -hmm. learning a piece of mind with a lot of arm clusters. And it's really cool because I've always played my own pieces with arm clusters. And this is the first time I'm having somebody else play a piece of mine with arm clusters. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm reminded of a lecture recital from a dear friend who did basically an entire lecture on harpsichord usage of, it was known as the Fouquet chord or Fouquet stop or whatever, but you just take your whole palm and on the very bottom of the harpsichord, you just is exactly yeah, it's a legitimately spooky sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the crunching of bones or something. Exactly, exactly. It's very creepy stuff. Well, it's interesting that you brought Poulenc too, because you are now the second composer that has brought up Poulenc. <laughs> the other oh, being oh, wow. Martin, because yeah, Marty was also very inspired in a lot of her stuff. I, I can definitely hear the Poulenc in both of your uh, compositions, because it is true for those who uh, are watching this now, who are not as familiar with Francis Poulenc, and I highly recommend you listen to some of his stuff. Uh, it's very much, it's coming out of the family of Debussy, but it's a little bit later, and there is a little more wit to it, maybe, than, say, Debussy, who's extremely, very serious. <laughs> very yeah, Poulenc is the only composer I've ever heard in concert where people laughed. Like, yeah. I was uh, hearing a symphonietta. And people were actually like laughing at parts. And I'm like, wow, what a great reaction to get from an audience, not as a gimmick, but yep. just as um, uh, an emotional response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, <laughs> are you familiar with the Poulenc cello sonata at all? Uh, I probably heard it. I can't think of it right now. Yeah. For, for those watching, you should definitely check it out at some point. But there is a direction that says in the piano score where the page turner has to go turn a page for the cellist because they're playing about like 500 measures of 16 <laughs> in the middle of it. And there's no time, you just keep going, you keep going, and then the... Well, you know, it makes me wonder if that was uh, maybe a publisher's edition. It might Because the publishers were the one fitting it on the page and they're like, hey, Polanyi, you either rewrite it or, you know, this is your only option. Exactly. It's also, I mean, that movement, it's very difficult, but it also does sound rather silly kind of carnival-esque it's yeah good yeah I, I like the idea of humor in music um you know another big influence for me is sati i remember learning a piece by his in college and mm -hmm. it uh there were really just strange uh directions in there that could never actually really be communicated like one part was to play suspiciously right or you know i think a lot of times he was sort of telling you what to do on your face more than, or just as much as what to do, you know, with the sound. That, that's a great, I, yeah, I'm going to take those. Yeah, lines. I think it was just like as much acting as it was uh, playing. Exactly. exactly, very good stuff. Well, let's actually get into some of these pieces. Um, and it is very interesting. Uh, we're going to start first talking about some of the uh, pieces on the more formal concert, the stuff that is uh, recorded in St. Paul's, mm -hmm. which I do have to say, it does have witty moments, but it also is extremely meditative music. So specifically, uh, this is Omnium Rerum Principa Parvas Sunt, and then, if I get all this, Nemo Igitur Vir Magnus Sine Alico, Ad flatu divinu umquam fuit. Those are two different pieces. It's the second and fourth piece in that recording for those who are keeping score. Um, and there are definitely some sort of, you know, witty moments and definitely some moments where the theme kind of gets repeated in a whole variety of keys and there's just a sort of inventiveness aspect to it. But then there are other points like in the beginning of, uh, we've been calling it Nemo, the yeah, second, the working you know, title. Exactly. Um, that it is just space. And it's just, you have brief moments of sound strain out and then just silence. And then you continue again in silence. I'm wondering um, kind of what's your um, philosophical, first of all, what are the translations? And then secondly, kind of what is your philosophy behind kind of the compositions of these as well as kind of how to listen to them? 
Well, uh, this suite that I gave you, which is uh, three uh, cello pieces, actually does have a story behind it. Mm -hmm. I was trying to reconcile my feelings about the genre of minimalism. Mm. Um, I don't personally care for it. Sometimes I feel like the, the listener is working harder than the performer is. Mm. But I was trying to, to sort of integrate it into uh, my thought process. So I was trying to think, well, when in nature does this ever happen, that something is repeated and repeated and repeated sort of ad nauseum? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really think of anything. Um, you know, I was like, okay, maybe bird calls. But if you really listen to a bird call, they're actually inconsistent. And I think probably intentionally, like, they might sound the same, but the slight inconsistencies may be part of the expression of the bird song. Right. So it's like, well, maybe not bird song. So I thought maybe like a barking dog. Hmm. But if you listen to a barking dog, it's also inconsistent. And I think that adds to the sort of the agitation of it is that mm -hmm. each bark is slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I, I was sort of insects. I couldn't really think of anything. Uh, but then I did. I was like, oh my gosh, like, maybe a woodchuck, you know, the way a woodchuck is chucking wood. And so I, I looked on YouTube, uh, I looked up some videos and it, and it is indeed, it's a, like a chump, 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 chump. And I was like, oh, well that seems regular and it, and it seems to be uh, a way that minimalism is found in nature. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wrote um, the, how much wood could a wood chuck chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood piece because I wanted to uh, make a programmatic piece that was telling the story of a wood chuck chucking wood. Exactly. And for those who are listening, this is the one that's on the salon concert. Actually, it's going to be the one that concludes that particular performance. Um, yes. So, uh, and you will find, I, I decided, yep, yeah, Ryan has very inventive I don't know about directions as much as suggestions as to what certain uh, parts represent. And I did take the time, Ryan, you'd be glad to know, to put those in the video. So hopefully- Oh, okay. They'd be like, okay, that's what this is supposed to represent. This is what this is supposed to represent. But it's interesting too, because you're talking about repetition and the form itself repeats that you, it's, and not just, it's, I was gonna say Rondo, I guess. Because it's not yeah. necessarily one recap. It's not one recapitulation. Almost like a quasi um, sonata allegro form. Yeah. And it's just a lot of repetition of the same sort of material and how it relates with stuff after it. Which actually, by the way, is something that's very common with a lot of Jeff's pieces. So that does apply very well. Well, I'm glad you connected with it. Maybe the woodchuck is your spirit animal. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> But, no, uh, yeah. everyone in the comments, be kind, please. Yeah, exactly. Well, it looks like they're very fastidious and they're really hard workers. So, you know, that describes you, right? <laughs> I, I try, I try. Um, so, so, yeah, that title, um, Quantum uh, Materia, Materiatum Marmota Motax, C Marmota Motax, uh, Materium Passet Materiari, is Latin. I don't know if that phrase began as a Latin phrase. I'm guessing not. I'm guessing it's just a rough translation. But it was important to me that I find ways to um, to make these pieces in the suite relate to one another. And not only were they the same thought process, me trying to figure out how to inject some um, minimalism into my writing, but also that they're all Latin phrases. I figured that nomenclature nomenclature sort of um, related them to one another. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any particular route as to why Latin specifically as opposed to any of the other? You know, I uh, was using French, French phrases because I found that French phrases really captured certain essences that we didn't have in normal terms of phrases that we would have in English. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, there was a play I wrote, uh, Boudou Sans Latin, which is like at the end of your Latin. That's the literal translation. Now, it's meaningless in English, but in French, it means that you are all out of words. You've even used all the Latin words you can think of, and you mm. still don't have the words to say what you mean. So I, I found that it was not only educational, you know, good program notes that people People can think, oh, that's now encapsulating uh, a thought that I didn't have words for. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, it, you know, it makes for, for good press. <laughs> kind of something, not exactly. only a piece, but a story, you know. Exactly. Is, is that kind of the mentality that goes into the other uh, two parts of the suite, the Omnium and the Nemo? Mm-hmm. Or, because can you give the translations of those two? Because they're rather similar, but not entirely. If, as uh, right. Sure. Uh, Omnium rerum uh, principia sunt means uh, everything has small beginnings. Right. So in that piece, I was thinking, okay, so when in our lives would something happen over and over and over again, sort of in a minimalistic way? And I thought, well, writing a piece, because I will often begin with just a little earworm or a sound bite that goes over and over and over and over in my head. And from that spinning spools out a melody and the rest of a piece. Mm-hmm. So it starts with, you know, that sort of circular motion and then it tangents out from there. At least that's how I think of writing a piece mm-hmm. or that's how I approach writing a piece is I start with sort of an inkling mm-hmm. and then it spun out from there. So that was the idea behind that piece is that um, it rolls and rolls this thought around until eventually a piece comes out of it. For the, for those who are, um, if you listen to it numerous times, those who are going to listen to this concert, you will probably readily identify as the first four notes. It's the F, A, G, E, and it kind of goes back and forth um, between using that as a theme and then using it kind of as a germination point, as Ryan was just mentioning. So listen to that piece and you'll kind of see how it it's almost a variations off of that, those four notes, basically, to a certain extent. You know, and it's actually funny that you should bring up that melody because it helps me remember the title. I sort of wrote the melody around the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. And when you get to the eighth notes later in the second page, yeah, no, but. Definitely so it's not only a melody, it's, uh, it's got lyrics. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's what another thing that's very interesting about your particular style. And I guess you could say actually it's the same with all the other composers, just that you do it in different ways. But all three of you have a very uh, rhetorical perspective and a very uh, rhetorical way of working around with your melodies in that you could basically set any of these pieces to words. Yeah, a lot of times I will take songs that I've written and um, turn them into instrumental pieces because I can take what you would be able to sing and expand it into something that still sounds song-like but with, you know, a range that's outside of maybe the normal singing range or put in, you know, double stops or, you know, uh, more than one note at a time. So especially for Nemo, I began with a melody that I had written. It was originally a setting of an E.E. E. Cummings poem. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day. Mm-hmm. It's a great poem. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, I could take that and uh, just turn it, just make it into something more than it was already because it was just originally a, sort of a simple children's song. Mm-hmm. And that melody actually ended up helping me memorize the title too, because I was um, singing the title along with the melody. Nemo ipiter vir magnus sine aliqua et flatum divino unco on fluid. Yeah, that totally makes sense, because especially in the way that it's uh, formatted both on the music itself, but also I took that same spacing where you cut off primarily at a certain point in the phrase and you start a new line with the other phrase and it completely goes according to yeah da 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 yeah 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 it uh, was it was a natural break in the latin title too exactly exactly so really fascinating stuff joined by my housemates here oh hello <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yes, I always love it when pets show up on these things. Um, now, one of the questions I've also been asking uh, the other composers, and I would like to ask you now, um, one of the things that performers sometimes have to think about, and especially in 20th century works, but not always, the relationship between the composer, the performer, and the audience. So really the idea of, obviously, the composer is coming up with 
the actual written music performer brings that into a sonic existence and then the audience is there to receive and that's usually the that's traditional the that's the traditional way of viewing it but that's been played around with a lot and especially in the 20th century and i'm wondering kind of how do you view your role as a composer um in kind of the assemblage of your works for a concert yeah, I mean, I, I totally think that's the the holy trinity of music is composer, performer, audience. And uh, for me personally, I always write with my audience in mind. Um, I think it's great every now and again to write something for yourself. Hmm. But my overall goal is to be clear and understandable and relatable. Mm -hmm. um, I love experimental music, but I don't always connect with it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's easy to write something sort of weird, but it's really difficult, or it is for me, I think, to write something that people can really connect with. Like I've always said, you know, anybody can entertain you, but what composers can make you cry? You know, I think those are always our favorites, is the ones that don't just entertain, they, they uh, touch us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my goal as a composer, is to connect uh, with the audience. And uh, I, I think it's easy to connect with the performer because performers are doing it because they love it. Audiences are there and, and they don't always know what they're going to hear. So they may not always like it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's important to me uh, to give them a product, you know, a product that they're going to uh, enjoy and take with them. I find it very interesting because um, I could pretty much now take all three of your responses and string them together and it's basically going to be the same thing between the three of you the emphasis on clarity in particular yeah um the idea that so uh i think it was mari was talking about the clarity of form jeff was again also talked about kind of the clarity of message i just found that very interesting that it's coming from all three of you and yeah well, you know, uh, Poulenc was a big fan of, of Mozart. And it was because Mozart had a clarity to his music. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, I connected with, with Poulenc is that he always tried to make something that was clear. He appreciated clarity in music. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that's really tantamount to my whole uh, purpose as a composer is to make something that's understandable. You know, I don't want the the listener to be working harder than I am, you know. <laughs> so uh, clarity is something that I always strive for, not only in uh, melodic material that they can easily identify what the melody is and that the melody is branded sort of over the course of the piece, but also clarity of structure mm -hmm. that people can say, okay, now this is happening or now this is happening. Uh, so I'll often do, like you said, like a theme and variation idea so that they know, okay, I've heard this before, but it's a little different. Mm -hmm. Or uh, some very standard structures like Rondo form, Sonata Allegro form, uh, theme and variation is sort of like a form. So uh, those always guide me in uh, my compositional practices, the idea of melody, uh, structure, and also uh, sort of passage of time, what, what's happening over the course of the piece. Very good. Very, very, yeah, love that stuff. And love that all three of you kind of seem to agree on the same idea. Um, and then what makes you all three defer is really kind of the way, not so much the language that you write, because we were, uh, I was mentioning this with someone that your usage of, as we just said, structure is very similar, but what constitutes, say, a punctuation? or what constitutes a certain kind of phrase is very different between the three of you in terms of how you use tonality, in terms of how you use uh, traditional rhythm, even anything along those lines. So for you anyway, if you had your audience member who will be sitting down with this with hopefully very nice speakers or headphones or stuff like that, um, how would you want them to listen to your works? Uh, well, I think the important thing uh, for an audience member when they're really in tune with the music is that they're breathing with it. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, with contemporary composers, sometimes the sound can be similar, but the one thing that really helps me nail it down, which composer it is, is the breathability, mm -hmm. how that composer's music breathes. Mm -hmm. And that to me is sort of the hallmark. So I find that the 
the audience when um, when they're really, really understanding what I'm doing, they're breathing with it. So I always think of breathability uh, when I write and where those uh, phrases end and begin and when the periods are, you know, just like you would breathe during um, an oration or, you know, a speech or something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like really good, like say politicians, they have a breathability to their um, presentation mm -hmm. that audiences connect with. Very good. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for being here. And it's really wonderful to talk to you about all this stuff. And of course, this is, you know, all, this is a very shallow dive in terms of your, your compositional idea, but at least it will give between you and then also Margie and Jeff, it will give our audience a nice idea of what is similar between the three of you, what is different between the three of you. And I hope all of you will enjoy all these interviews as well as the concerts themselves. Yeah, it's always nice to talk about my uh, music with a musician because I feel like uh, maybe half or more than half of people who hear my music are not musicians. So right. it's nice uh, to have a professional opinion and a professional insight uh, and especially someone who spent time with my music like you have. Well, it's, it's, it's nice that you have the opportunity though then to have those who are not musicians listen to it. I also, because it can yeah. kind of be opposite things, right? You can have your people that are listen to primarily academics and conservatory, and then you've got yours who are not in any way in that form. So to try and bridge that gap, it's it's a yeah, hard. I value both bridge. types of input because I I find a lot of times the input is the same, just worded differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, I think that there's a lot to be said uh, for a technical pen, you know, coming from from a, a, per, a performer's perspective. All right, all right. Well, thank you very much again for joining us. Do you have any last thoughts, any last, um, either last thoughts or even if you have any major projects coming up you kind of want to advertise here or anything? Well, I will say I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the pieces and I'm really glad that you decided to eat local, <laughs> so <Yeah>. to speak, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, be, be locavorious. Exactly. And uh, I'm really excited that, you know, you're representing uh, some of the best of Cleveland. Thank you very, very much. I, I can only hope that I do justice. So yeah, for, uh, yeah, for everyone, uh, take a look at the description below. You will find links to both the more formal concert in St. Paul's. You've got the link for the more informal concert from my apartment. Um, and you will hear pieces of Ryan's in both of those. So until then, uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. I will see all of you at the concert hall. Thanks guys.